So we're about to do something that maybe you haven't done in a really long time. We're going to play a version of a game. Uh, maybe if you grew up in an American school, you've heard of this game. It's called uh, Heads Up, Seven Up. Remember that, that, that game? Some of you might be triggered by that because you know, I don't put my head down for anybody. I was hurt by that. Somebody hit me during that game. Maybe you came from a different country or you were saved the agony of playing this game. Good for you. Uh, we're not going to play the full game, but I'm going to ask you to do something that we don't normally do. Uh, and it's not super spiritual. It's just a moment for you to kind of ask yourself an honest question. So just close your eyes where you are. Whether you're watching online, maybe you're watching from one of our campuses, uh, or maybe you're driving, don't close your eyes. Uh, just want to make sure I cover my bases there for all the lawyers in the room. Uh, and if you are here at North Campus, go ahead and close your eyes. I'm going to ask you a, a couple of questions. I don't want you to be honest, all right? So some of you just need to maybe, everybody's going to participate. How many of you would say that uh, you, don't make any noises, it's just a show of hands, would say, I am really enjoying this Christmas season. Raise your hand. Like, you're just like, yeah, you're, you're enjoying it so much, you want to like yell out, right? I'm really enjoying this Christmas season. Okay, so now put it down. You're loving the, the lights, you're loving the trees, you're loving the shows, you're loving the food, all of it. And then, here's the second question. How many of us would be honest and say, listen, I'm not really a Scrooge. I'm just not in the mood this year. I've never really liked it. I don't understand it. I'm, it's not part of my culture. But if I'm going to be honest, I'm not really enjoying this year's Christmas season. Raise your hand. Be honest. All right. Appreciate it. Yeah. You guys aren't as excited to raise your hands as I can tell as everybody else. But quite a few people. So go ahead and, and, and open your eyes. And now you're wondering who didn't like Christmas around me. You're like trying to judge people. How do you not like Christmas? And yet um, there are some of us who don't get caught up with, with all of the stuff and the food. And you know the old adage, especially here in Texas, it's, it's food, family, and football, right? Especially during this holiday season. And some of us don't give into that. And we don't understand what that looks like. And others of us, we are 100% bought in. We love Christmas. We love everything about it. But what would it look like if we understood the Christmas story and the coming of Jesus to the earth from an outsider's perspective? What if we didn't have the experience? What if we didn't have the stories of our upbringing? What if we just knew there was something more and in that that journey of understanding there might be more we encounter, maybe even stumble upon the story of Christmas. And so that's the mindset I want us to have as we go into understanding the journey of the wise men, of the three kings. And there's different ways that they're described in scripture and in culture. But I want us to have that understanding of what if we encounter Jesus and the prophecies of Jesus, and the truth of Jesus, and the story of Jesus without any context of Jesus. And yet still pushed in and leaned in. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read. I've been reading quite a bit, a bit the last few months, because we want you to understand that, that, that Scripture really illuminates so much for, for us, especially if we read Scripture as story, and it's easy to do around Christmas time. So here we go, Matthew chapter 2, a few verses together. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Verse 5, in Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. So in case you didn't follow along, you have these magi who don't have context, who are not Israeli, who are not Jewish, who are not from that part of the world, who have traveled a long distance 
Because they've seen a star, they've heard the prophecies, and something ignited in them to come and worship this deity, worship this deity that has now come to the earth. They don't really know what's happening. They don't have the cultural norms. They just go to the king, and the king doesn't like what's happening. So he calls the religious leaders that are locally, say, what's happening? He gets the update, then he goes back to these magi and says, I want to know what you know. And after they go and explore what happens, he wants them to report back to him. And with not really good intentions. In verse 9. And after they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, listen to that. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Here you have these people just going off of a sense that there's a calling, there's a wooing, there's a drawing. They see a star, they hear the prophecy, they're following in faith, they're just exploring, they don't even know what they're going to find. And when they get there, they now see Mary, who's now in a house, not in a cave, not in a stable. It's a few days later, a few weeks later, and now they get to see and experience the truth of Jesus. And then they have another experience in a dream saying, do not go back but go back to your country through a different route. So what can we learn from this story? What's practical about the story? Because uh, you know, I was researching for this, and, and we have a team of people that, that write and put things together, and I was diving into it, and I was like, oh my gosh, I could do a whole series just on this. And so I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to pull it back a little bit because it's really exciting. But what are the practical things we can learn from the Magi and their story? And here's the four things. One, all are welcome into God's story. Number two, the journey of, of pursuing God is worth it. Number three, we should bring our best in that pursuit. And number four, we make room for others. We make room for others. So number one, all are welcome in God's story. Again, these are people, these, these magi, they obviously have some sort of wealth. Uh, many people in the early church believed that they were actually kings and rulers in their country. And that's why they thought that they had a position or availability to seek out King Herod because from one king or one ruler to another, right? So they saw themselves a little bit more elevated. So many people in the early church believe that they were actually rulers in the countries they came from, which more than likely meant that they were not followers of the same God. They were not anticipating in their religion the coming of Jesus. But somewhere along the line, there was some sort of moment or resolution where they knew there was more than what they had. And if you hear last week, we, we shared about, or two weeks ago, we talked about how, how Joseph and Mary had those encounters with the angels who said, do not be afraid. And, and the angels showed up to them. So we're believing that they had some sort of moment like that. And didn't just sit on it, but pursued it. And then they see the star. And somewhere in their hearts, knowing they were not part of the culture, knowing that they were from somewhere far off, felt drawn and invited into the room. That they had a place in the room. I don't know how they know that, except this wooing and this drawing, but it really does line up with Scripture. If you go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, the Lord says to Abram, Go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. See, God's story, God's creation story is one that invites us into the table. That, that says there is room for you. And I, and I know many of us maybe grew up in church or another religion. And we, and we want to segment people away. But it's the heart of God. It's the heart of the one who created us to say, I want sons and daughters and adopted sons and daughters to come to the table. And, and I want you to understand there is room for you. There is room for all at God's table. 
And somewhere the Magi believe this. I mean, can you imagine getting on a plane, going to another part of the world, to somebody else's Christmas dinner, and you're not sure you're even invited? Some of us would be like, I'm waiting for the Evite. I'm waiting for confirmation that I can go to this room. I mean, some of you are crazy enough to show up to football games without tickets. Or concerts without tickets. And you trust a scalper. Like, some of you just have that confidence. I don't. I want confirmation. You know when they ask you when you, when you purchase your movie tickets or a concert ticket or a show ticket or your kid's basketball ticket? And like, would you like confirmation? I'm like, yes. I want the email. I want proof that I purchased it. And yet the Magi traveled hundreds if not thousands of miles for some of them on this sense that they belong. On this sense that when I get there, I will be able to participate in it. Without the Evite. Revelation 7, 9 says this. This is John writing the book of Revelation. He says, And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, from tribe, and people, and language. Standing before the throne, and before the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Which is usually a reference to Jesus. And that's one of the things I love about our, our faith community here at Gateway is when I ask many people, to tell me what it's like to, to be part of Gateway and you hear things like, people look like me there. I heard somebody speaking my mother tongue when I walked into one of the lobbies. Paul and I were, were talking, you know, who's, who leads worship for us here at North uh, a few couple years ago. And I said, what is God telling you, calling you to do? And Paul, who, you know, leads worship for us, and you, many of you see him online. If you've been at Pflugerville, he was on staff there for a while. And he, he was in my office and a couple years ago, and he goes, God, you know, Carl, to be honest with you, there's not many people who look like me leading people from a stage. And yet Revelation says that is the norm in the kingdom of God. Every tribe, every nation, every skin color. There's something about all being welcome in God's story. Yes, even that person you are not looking forward to seeing next week. Even that person you're not sure about. Yes, all are welcome except my crazy uncle. All are welcome except my mother I haven't talked to in 20 years. All are welcome. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm trying to trigger a lot of people, but I want us to understand if you and I have an invitation to sit at a table that we do not deserve, who are we to say somebody else is disinvited? Maybe it's a message for another day, and yet I wonder if that really is the heart of God. Why? Because John 6, says this. We don't have this on the screen. Just follow along with me. That, you know, no one can come to know God fully unless the Spirit of God actually woos them and draws them in. And it reminds me of a story of a woman I love with my whole life, and I would lay down my life for her, and she's my wife. And my wife grew up in a family of a lot of dysfunction and addiction and abuse, uh, and yet always knew there had to be more. She grew up Catholic and she went to Mass and she saw there was something beautiful about it, but it never really connected with her. She was like, okay, I believe there's a God, but look at my life and look at my family. And she was hiding in her house because of all the abuse and she was a shell of a person. And at 16 years old, as a teenager, as a teenager, her boyfriend invited her to his church. And it was, let's just say, not a Catholic church. It was a Pentecostal church, and people were hanging from the chandeliers, and they were screaming, and there were flags everywhere. And my wife walked in like, oh, my gosh, what is this place? This is chaos. It is out of order. And yet she walked in at 16 years old and said, but I'm welcome here. And she gave her life to Christ. And she said, if there's room for anybody, could it be that there's this room for a 16-year-old girl who hides from her dad and mom because of the abuse, who, who's trying not to get caught up with drugs and alcohol, alcohol like the rest of my family. Like, I'm trying. There's this wooing happening, and there's a wooing, and I'm so glad she accepted the yes. 
even when everybody around her would have been okay if she fell into depravity, if she fell into having a child as a teenager, if she fell into drugs and alcohol, because that was the norm. And yet something in her, which we believe is the Spirit of God, said, no, there is more. There's room at the table for everybody. Number two, pursuing God is worth it. Pursuing God is worth it. And this is, this is, a, this is a, a part that I didn't struggle with talking about it, but I really wanted to spend a lot of time. And, and in the new year, we'll talk about these kinds of things. But you understand the word pursuit is a verb, right? It is taking action. The Magi could not have said, well, they could have said, well, we're going to send one of our servants hundreds of miles to verify the truth. And then when I know it's true, I will go see for myself. And yet, inside of them was this notion and this growing desire that, no, if it is true, I want to see it and experience it for myself. That I, as a leader, a spiritual leader, a wealthy person, maybe even a king of a region, I am going to go on this journey and I'm going to take people with me, and I'm going to take a lot of treasure with me because I want to experience this truth for myself. They pursued a passion that was growing inside of them, and they could have been indifferent. They could have been, ah, I don't know, maybe it's a fairy tale. And instead they pursued it. And you have to know that once you come to know who God is, pursuing God is worth it, but it will cost you something. It costs us all something. Harry Newman says this in the pursuit of God, that without the silence, the solitude, the moments of being alone, where you, you know that the journey and the pursuit is about you, without solitude, it is impossible to have a spiritual life. Without solitude, it's impossible to have a spiritual life. So, so what is solitude? Ruth Haley Barton says this, the invitation to solitude and silence is an invitation to enter more deeply into the intimacy of relationship with the one. The one who waits just outside the noise and busyness of our lives. The one who waits for us. There's this invitation to pursue God. And sometimes we love the pursuit when the music's on because it drowns out our voice because we don't sing very well. Or it drowns out our wife's voice next to us and she doesn't sing very well. Don't hit her right now. Don't, don't elbow her. It's okay. Make a joyful noise. Some people take it literally. It's fine, okay? And yet what happens when there's no music? What happens when there's nobody on stage in your home leading you in Scripture? Do we still pursue? Do we still take those steps? Do we, do we, do we think it's worth it? James, the half-brother of Jesus, Mary was his mother, says this in James chapter 4. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he says, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. What was the last thing you really pursued? See, we pursue because we have the mind of Christ. It's 1 Corinthians 2, 16. We, when we have the mind of Christ, there's a pursuit. Jesus didn't just come to the earth and was born. And he was like, oh, we'll just see what happens when I'm there. We'll see who I meet. Oh, I ha happen to meet a few people. I kind of happened to do a few miracles. No, there was a pursuit that Jesus even had in his calling to come to the earth. And I'm wondering, do we know what it takes to truly pursue God? Do we know and consider the lengths the Magi took to encounter baby Jesus? What they left behind, what they sacrificed, and yet sometimes some of us struggle because it's 40 degrees outside. Yes, I'm trying to hit a nerve right now. Ooh, it's 40 degrees. Do I go outside or not? Whew. What do I do? Whew. It's cold. Some of you watched it online and are like, 
shut up, Carlos, you know, we're, we're home for that reason right now. I get it. I get it. But I wonder, hey, hmm, let's take it a step further. How many of us would question the weather if Taylor Swift was in town last minute tonight? It could be negative 40 degrees and some of us would be outside. What if she even said, who wants to, what if she said it was free? Yep. What if she says, I'm going to get the biggest stadium in Texas. It's going to have 110,000 people for free. The kicker is it's 40 degrees outside right now. See, I'm taking my time with this on purpose. See, because pursuit costs you something. It costs me something. There's a reason why my kids didn't go to a Taylor Swift concert. Because I'm a cheapskate. I don't like to pay the cost. I don't like to count the cost. Somebody told me today, nice sweater you have on today. See what happens when you spend $20 on an item? It's awesome. And I found it this summer on sale. When everybody's buying shorts and t-shirts, I look for the winter stuff because it's cheap. Why? I don't like to count the cost. I don't like to pay the price. And yet the Magi are willing to pay a price with their lives and with their treasure to experience baby Jesus. And I wonder, are we willing to pay a price for the one who created us and is with us and is for us? It is worth it. See, when we, when we take those steps, our lives are changed. I am dumbfounded sometimes when I just talk to somebody and they say, you know, after three years of being a gateway, we finally joined a group and it changed our lives. Oh my gosh, we met people that we've, we've been wanting to meet. Why did we wait three years? I'm excited for people when they look at one of our staff and they say, you know what? We finally, I'm finally taking steps towards my road towards recovery, my addiction issues, whatever those are. I'm, I don't know why I waited so long. I, I can tell you why we wait so long, because we don't like to pay a price. We wonder the pros and the cons of every situation, and yet here you have Christ entering into the world, asking you to be at a table, and I am telling you now, the pursuit of knowing him is worth it. But it doesn't come free. And yet, number three, it doesn't come free. And yet God deserves your best, my best, our best. I mean, what does a baby do with gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Lick it. That's about it. Now, as a self-proclaimed cheapskate, I would love it if for my children's birthday you gave them gold, frankincense, and more. I would totally be okay with it. But really, the truth is, they brought their best, and what their best was so over the top. And if you had children, and your, maybe they were, your, your children were the first grandchildren, oh my gosh, my older kids got everything from their grandparents. Like my son... Carlos had a whole wardrobe of Ralph Lauren clothes when he was six months old. Because his grandparents said, our grandson's going to have the best of everything. Max, 15 years later, here's a pair of socks, son. It's different. It's just different. And I wonder for us, what does it mean we know when we give our best? When you're at work, you know when you've worked a solid work week. Like, you know it. You can feel it in your gut. Like, man, I gave everything I got. And some of us know we didn't give a good solid week of work, and yet we skate by, or we act like we're busy, or we stay the extra hour, but you're really playing Candy Crush on your phone in your office. Like, you're not really working. We're projecting. Because we know what it means to give our best. We know what our marriages, our lives, our friendships, our groups, our spiritual life. We know when we give our best and we know when we don't. 
And yet Jesus came to give us his best. And we can watch the example of the Magi that they came ready to give their best. They didn't come like tip Jesus. Oh, it's real. Boop, here's a little gift. They came in an extravagant way. And that, I think that is what God wants from us. First and foremost, he wants you and he wants your heart. That's the greatest gift. That's the greatest gift. You know, I struggle nowadays trying to figure out what to give my mom and dad for Christmas. Because for years, you know what my dad told me? Son, I don't need anything for Christmas. I don't want anything for my birthday. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I can do that, Dad. I will oblige, you know, your request. And then I turn 18, he goes, you know, I want one thing for my birthday. What is it? I want you to love God. I was like, well, you're not getting that either. <laughs> I was very upfront with my dad. Uh, you're, the gift to you is that I would love Jesus. Like, nah, it's just not going to work. A few years later, I gave my life to Christ. And my dad would still say, oh, I don't need any gifts. <laughs> man, you are loving Jesus and you're growing. And man, you're raising your family to love Jesus. And about 10 years ago, it changed. She was like, you know, a gift every once in a while wouldn't hurt. I'm like, you said the greatest gift I get. Yeah, but you know what? It's been 20 years. Maybe a Christmas gift would help. And I struggle with that. Not that I don't want to give my parents gift, gifts. It's, it's this idea of giving my best. Do I give my best in every situation, in every relationship, everywhere I turn? And do I bring my best to God? I, this last week, was contemplating what you, hopefully, you're contemplating. Like, okay, God, as we do life by life, what do you want me to do? And I had a number in my head. And I was like, okay, God, I'm going I'm to do this. And, and I, here's what I felt for myself. This is my own personal journey. Is that your best? And within five seconds, I knew, this is all happening in my head, by the way. I'm not, like, literally talking. I was like, no, it's not my best. And I heard this question come up, what is your best? And a number popped in my head. And I was like, yeah, but I was going to use that for something. I was going to use that in case Michigan makes the national championship. I was going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And Lord's like, I just want your best. No condemnation. Have I given you my best? Give me your best. So this morning I gave my best the way I'm challenging our church to give our best. Like on this giving Sunday, can we do that? Why? Because God deserves our best. And to know this, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, that the more I give, the more God will entrust back to me. And the measure you give will it be given to you. And for me, it's not even about money. You know what it is? God has entrusted me to lead a church. And do I not want to be part of a church that is leading more and more people to know Jesus? More and more people to walk in freedom. More and more people to be healthy, living as a single person, and maybe one day they'll get married. More and more people who are married, who have healthy marriages to raise great families. More and more kids in our kids' church so they can one day tell their friends about Jesus. See, see how this works? I, I don't care about the money piece. You know, I care about God. Would you entrust me with a healthy, growing church that makes a difference in our city and around the world? And the more we do, the more God trusts us with. Can we give our best? And the fourth thing we learn is this. We can make room for others. You know, most traditions believe that the Magi, when they came uh, to Bethlehem, were not by themselves. Because they were rulers and they were really wealthy, uh, many people would, would, would say they probably had a whole group of people with them. People who were servants, maybe even wives with them or, or other leaders with them. But they weren't just the three people. Maybe they were the three most important people. But there's many traditions that believe that there may have been dozens of people with them. Can you imagine the confidence they had to show up not just for themselves, but maybe dozens of people would be invited as well? You know that person who shows up to your party and they bring somebody with them and they didn't tell you? Or that person that brings five people with them and they didn't tell you? It's fine, it's fine. And you run to the kitchen and you're like, I hate them right now, I can't believe they did that. And you come back out so happy, I'm so glad you're here. 
And yet they saw that there was room and they wanted others to come. And so I wanted to read John chapter one to you about Jesus and it says, and he came to his own people and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with the physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. That even Jesus, as he came, was rejected in his own hometown, rejected by those who knew him or knew his family story. And yet, if people would pursue him, that there was a life beyond his own personal rejection. He was rejected his entire life, all the way up unto the cross, and those closest to him left him. And yet he still pursued the right thing. And, and, and it reminds me, to close out the story of my wife, she was 16, came to know Jesus. And it reminds you, she's in a family with a lot of dysfunction and abuse and, 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 a, and uh, a drug addiction, alcohol addiction. And you know what I love about my wife? She took the gift that God had given her of freedom and of truth and of love. and She didn't keep it to herself. She shared it with her mom. She shared it with her dad. She shared it with her siblings, the very people she was living this life with that brought, that brought a lot of hurt that she's had to walk through for years. And yet she still wanted them to have the gift of God through his son, Jesus. And do you know, she started doing that at 16 years old, a teenager. And within one year, every one of her siblings and her mom and dad came to believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah. There's, there has to be a belief in us that this gift that we have is also for everyone. That, that the gift of God, that there is room for us at the table, that in this pursuit, it is worth it. In that pursuit, we bring our best. And after we bring our best, that God desires for us to share and to make room for others. No matter what hangups we have, no matter what issues we have. So what we're going to do now is we've talked about solitude and making room. But I want you to do right now is just to kind of just settle in. We're going to close this out. But Paul called this week and he was like, hey, I really feel like I should kind of lead our church through this song as we think about making room for, for God. So would you just be still, allow Paul to sing this and lead us in this. And we'll pray out and close out our service. But I want you to think about this question. Have you accepted the fact that there is room for you? Think about this, second question. Are you truly actively pursuing God? with number three, the best that you have. And then number four, where are we making room for others?